project. Um, and um, as we said, um, we would go uh, into a moment where uh, the speakers will ask each other's questions. Uh, we will pay attention to the chat if people in the room have questions that they uh, would want to ask. So Amara, is there a question uh, that you would want to ask either Fiona or Rick? I would love to, um, I would love to, I, I, I didn't mention to Rick that I've been uh, such a big uh, advocate of his work prior and, um, you know, I often use, uh, talk about Project Row Houses and, um, and, and your practice in, in, in relation to, um, I think there's something about the, the, the pragmatic, the pragmatism of what you do. Um, but it's really enlightening to hear you actually say, you know, that, that there comes to be like a scale where it's like, I'm not able to, I'm not able to use my, my instinct in this space. I'm not able to practice as an artist in the way that feels intuitive to me. Like, you know, that, that was a, that was a moment of, of stepping away for you from Project Row Houses and into some other things. I can imagine that leading to uh, lots of questions, lots of like, even maybe an internal dialogue with yourself that I wonder if you can speak to I'm particularly thinking about um what it means to grow a thing you know and grow a really ambitious thing and walking away from it for a reason I think there's there's um there's something about that that I'd just really love you to to speak to if possible well yeah um you know actually so I would I would say that it, it was just this given moment in time that it just felt like, I mean, I had a bunch of other things to do, you know, and I, I mean, I've been doing it for so long. It's like, it's just natural to, to me to, to want to engage something else. And I say that because, you know, I, I actually have this diagram that I've been working on kind of about the arc of the work of Project Row Houses and, 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 and artists socially engaged projects in general, right? I think, there's this notion to me that that the way that I work on things is I try to start from a very practical, pragmatic perspective, and then I try to just insert just a little bit of a, you know, an art creative kind of thing within it, just a little tiny thing, and then allow it to grow, you know, and it grows, and then, and at a certain point in a project in Project Row Houses for me, it started with this very practical thing of just getting the land, cleaning the land, provide, you know, a very physical community, you know, development thing. But then with the creativity kind of stuff coming in, but then, and, and it got to a point several different times where the balance between the practical aspects of it and the poetics were just completely equal. And it's a beautiful thing, but nothing sustains there, right? And so then it would, it would shift. It would shift sometimes to being much more of a poetic symbolic thing than it would having deal with practical things. And then sometimes it would shift to being more practical than aesthetics. And so, so I found myself throughout the years of being in places where I thought, you know, probably after about, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years, I was thinking, oh, I should just leave this. I don't, I don't fit any longer. There's nothing to do. But if you hang around long enough and you're being, you know, you're, you're practicing your creative, you know, DNA, you find ways to engage, you know, and then I'd engage again and then would go to another point and then I'd go, oh, okay, I'm done now. After, you know, 12 years, 15 years, I was like, I'm done. And then something else comes. And so, but this time it, it, it hit a point where it was just like, it just, there was just so many other things, but also it's, it's not like it's over too, you know? I mean, I have a relationship with that entity and maybe there's another point in my life that it might fit again, but, but yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it, but I, I have to say this though, it is really nice to be able to be a part of something that you can step away from. And even if it continues in ways that depart from your sensibilities, that it still exists and other people are, you know, moving in, that it's a great feeling. I'm resonating very deeply with that. So thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, and then I guess I had a question um, for you, Fiona, because, you know, power, like power comes up so so much in your work um, in lots of different ways, um, and I think there was a there was a the first project that you shared um, around the police. Like I just wonder how much um, 
sort of like healing maybe um sort of like trauma and healing I guess plays a part in your in your practice if it does at all like how like how do you how do you speak about power in 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 that context um yeah yeah it's an interesting question I mean it's funny, I, it, they're not, the certainly healing is not a word I, I use. And I was quite, the question I had for you was exactly based on that word because you use it so fluidly and you talked about a healing infrastructure, which, you know, I, I found myself noticing in a particular way. Um, so it's interesting that you asked me that question as well. Um, I mean, I guess for me, there, there's, yes, there are these moments you know when you once you're dealing once you're engaging with story as material you're you're into the lived experience of people and that can be traumatic of course um and once you're talking about power and lived experience and powerlessness you're into a territory that is risky you know that people are bringing up stuff i guess for me the 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 infrastructure of reality youth project as an organization with a team of youth workers is always the context in which the, the, the store opening up of story really can can work because there's a support structure there and there's beyond any particular art process or moment or creative um, expression of that um, there's also this this significant support structure professional youth workers who, who will continue with young people on journeys through those stories to explore and unpack and and so in those moments um absolutely there there are moments of healing and there's moments i mean we're always i suppose trying not to re-traumatize would be a you know a key ambition obviously so once you're engaging with stories one of the, the, the sort of features i suppose in working with stories has been trying to to do that collectively so a group tells stories they're always anonymous but they're worked with collectively and then there's a situation where nobody knows whose story is whose but we start to work with them as material and there's a kind of a de-individualizing of inequality that can happen as you, you you start to identify that your story is not just yours it belongs to to a story a wider story of oppression and so there's a, a you could call it some sense of healing or solidarity that comes in a moment like that and then in the public manifestations we're trying to i suppose at once speak back to ourselves people who've shared stories and a wider public and create a another another um experience for those stories so maybe those exploring those stories are shifting now because you know the whole concept i suppose of story is that it, you never tell the same story twice it's always a, a version and it grows and and so you you add another moment to that story by performing it doing something with it um and so yeah that creates um, that creates a new experience that then becomes part of your own experience, but it's a collective experience. Never work with people individually on stories. It's always part of this collective. So, um, but maybe I can I can ask you back the question in relation because I was quite struck by what you talked about a healing infrastructure and making it spiritually sustainable, which you know, just yeah, I suppose just as a as a statement felt quite big. And I, I was going to ask you, would you speak a little bit more to that, just in terms of, of, of kind of how, how you would attend to that? I think there's, um, I think you said it in your, in your sharing about um, investing in like long termism or you use, you use something, something like that. I think um, I'm really interested in and a lover of the healing justice movement. Um, and I remember so one of the things I'm currently working on was inspired by um, uh, Deanna Van Buren's organization, um, Designing Justice Designing Spaces, um, in which she's talking about restorative justice and says, um, the punitive justice system is really wrong, right? Um, it, it doesn't work, it's not fit for purpose, it's never, it's never healed anything, it hasn't, it hasn't repaired any harm, it hasn't um, amounted to justice in any form of the sense. So everything that our crim criminal justice system is based on in the global West, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work. So she says, how do we build spaces that are appropriate for restorative justice? Like, what would that look like? How do you physically design space where restorative justice is possible? because we know courthouses, you can't have, justice is not formed in a courthouse. It, does, it doesn't manifest in a prison cell. It doesn't manifest in a detention center, but where it does manifest is, is in healing circles, where it might manifest is in, um, is in interpersonal dialogue, where it might manifest, you know, is in all of these other spaces. So how do you design the spaces where that could be possible? And then I really love where Adrian Marie Brown talks often about like, 
we talk a lot about this like fictitious idea of what justice is and in order to get there we haven't even worked out what it looks like in our interpersonal conversations like I fall out with my sister and then I don't want to talk to her for like a month or whatever and you know we haven't even worked it out in our in our on a small scale and I really love that in emergent strategy she talks about um everything like change being fractal so how you do the small things is how you do the big things. If we can't look at what justice and what love looks like in our interpersonal relationships, what repair and healing looks like in our interpersonal, how do we expect to do it at the systemic level? So one of the projects that I'm working with at the moment is ex like exploring that really, really gently, really, really slowly. How do you design um, physical infrastructure that can support the facilitation of that work? Um, and I think for me, healing, healing infrastructure, we know, like, we know where it doesn't exist. We know where the conditions for harm have been um, baked into um, what currently exists. Even if, you know, at the moment we've got theatres that are being temporarily used as courthouses. Um, and, and that's a massive infringement of, 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 of liberty, of freedom, of expression, of community, safety, and all of those things. We've got, um, you know, what's happening right now with the sort of um, heritage sector at, at threat by uh, Oliver Dowden and his mates, <laughs> um, you know, talking about, um, uh, I guess, um, silencing and, um, and erasing narratives that are rooted in racial justice in the UK. Um, so I'm very much in, interested in that really slow process of exploring what does it actually mean to heal and what kind of systems do we need to align to and be building to in order to make that happen. Um, yeah, I just saw also a uh, comment coming from uh, Danielle in the in the chat um, when expressing um, a question around healing um, it says we often find healing for the community comes from being valued heard and respected and it comes when young people are giving a safe space to speak their truth and be heard accepted and belongings and this can be very healing the work we always do is supporting young people to understand their needs and attempt to have them met and healing happens when some of these meds, needs are met. Um, I thought I just wanted to point that out as I try to also encourage other people to uh, put questions in the, the chat or comments or, um, yes, so we'll try to follow, uh, so, follow this. Um, I actually have to leave shortly. I mean, that's the, the top of the hour, but, um, but you know, I wanna just throw something out that that um, and this is for you know both Fiona and and Amara, um, that that the uh, Amara that the this this idea of um, see how to say it I I just it stuck with me for a long time after hearing this like many years ago from Mel Chin another artist that I, I mean, a good friend and artist um, and I'm seeing it more clearly in some situations I'm working now but. I remember it was back in maybe 96 or so, we were doing a project in LA at some space and, and it was five of us and, uh, and they were asking each person to talk about who they wanted to work with and blah, 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 what communities. And you know, my interest was with you know, lower income African-American community because I experienced working with project or houses and everybody else kind of said the stuff. But then Mel Chen said, and he's, very funny provocative person you know he said i'm in hollywood i want to work with the overserved which was kind of a, a striking thing right i mean you know to hear someone talk about working with the overserved and um you know and his things because he's in in, in in hollywood you know it's like what, what are these people in hollywood doing you know the hollywood you know, where all the resources are and yeah i always thought that was very interesting and provocative and now so working on this project in um in, in, in Tulsa around uh, the, the Tulsa massacre, you know, it's very, it's very easy and very, you know, nobody questioned and everybody understand the need to work with the, the people who were maybe the descendants or, or have some connection to that history, the black people there, you know, to, to work with them and tell their story or whatever. But 
to me, part of the healing process of Tulsa around this particular massacre, if it's only being dealt with from the perspective of the, the victims and not the perpetrators, then, you know, I, it's just that it's, it's been a very challenging thing for me because as we were select trying to find artists to, to generate things around, generate conversation around this particular issue, which I, I personally try really hard to try to find white artists in Tulsa who could produce work that could help bring some level of conversation around what was the, what was the role? I mean, what's the what's the responsibility of what are the what's the thinking from a white perspective that was equally a part of that? And that's a challenge that we have, you know, uh, you know, around the whole you know issue of race. And it's beginning to kind of come up a little bit now that people are beginning to see that, you know, the 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 the, the issue around race is not simply solved by you know people of color dealing with it. You, you know, it's it's about you know people that have the privilege of you know not being a person of color to also deal with their side, you know, their issues. And um, anyway, so so I, I I always think of that in terms of you know you know working with the um, you know the ill-gotten powerful people. You know, I mean, the, you know, I mean, how do how do we work with the other with with the overserved? You know, in a sense, in the male chin uh, way. But anyway, I just wanted to just throw that as something that. Is is uh, something that I'm thinking about a lot, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how how that might. Yeah, any 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 insight on that topic? Yes, I have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and also, I really I do have to go in five minutes, Max. So I'm gonna. So if I just disappear, that's because. I, okay. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, certainly, Rick. When you when you say that question, I think the current project we're working working on and Danielle who you read out there Jana is is my core collaborator in Rialto Youth Project I think I assume um, but we're working on a project at the moment ourselves and Broken Talkers Theatre Company called What Does He Need and this really picks up on the where the project Natural History Hope left off in the sense of some of the questions around um, what what sociologist Kathleen Lynch described in observing our project around the liability of men in women's lives as one of the themes that came up and yet at the same time there was this um, love and adoration of women for their their boys and their their, ch their male children and, and many men and so there was this tension between um, between I suppose this 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 violence this potential violence or threat of some form of masculinity and then the nurturing of boys and so this project tries to open up the question of what does he need but asks that in a way that we're really looking for men to come and, and, and work on the project from the point of view of being that maybe the seen as the more powerful in that in that regard in the way you describe and um, in terms of the equivalent of the, the white artist so um, that's the closest I have in terms of that question of now and I suppose in doing that what we're trying to be careful is that we don't just attract uh, you know sort of a, a demographic of working class men that we're, 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 we're exploring ways that different groups of more powerful men could engage and make a boy and look at how he's formed and shaped and the, the, the sort of the yeah, his, his formation and what that makes him in terms of a, a particular approach to, to being powerful um, and his needs in relation to that. And, and so that's the kind of the nearest equivalent I have in the sense of at the moment trying to figure out in terms of the gender, who to work with, you know, as a response to doing a project for years with women and speaking and presenting ourselves and speaking back, now trying to flip into that. But obviously, once you get into the space of masculinity, um, you know, it's to be opened up rather than to be entirely provocative. But there's, you know, there's lots of really interesting work exploring how it is that boys and young men are shaped and formed to behave in certain ways. So we're in that territory and it's extremely rich and we're, we're you know, it's going in lots of different directions, but maybe that's the nearest thing I have. Um, and it is, to me, it's, it's, it's utterly important what you're describing in the sense of trying to attend to the more powerful person as a, as a participant. I really believe that in the context of race, if we were to be able to answer that question, we would find the like solution to what what next after capitalism. Like if we were to actually, you know, like get to the root of of that issue. And I think part of that comes to um, a fear of what accountability would actually mean for the the Hollywood crew, or a fear of what accountability would actually manifest as. 
Um, people, people are very scared about being accountable to something that they're upholding and don't realize they're upholding it if they feel like it, it would tear them apart. They would be left with nothing if for this thing. And I, I feel like, um, again, it's this thing about accountability. We're asking people to be accountable for something massive like huge where we, we don't even know how to be accountable in our interpersonal relationships yet we don't even know how to be accountable to our to our families to our children to our grandparents you know all of those things and 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 we're asking for um we're asking for accountability that actually like lead to you know radical overhaul of capitalism which racism thrives on um and then I and then the conflict is, if that doesn't happen, it, it often falls on the shoulders of black and black, you know, minds, black thinkers, black practitioners, or people of color to do that work. And now, of course, everybody is over exhausted. And for generations, people have been exhausted. And, um, and, uh, you know, James Baldwin, always he, that quote about how much time does it take? Like, how much time do you want for your change? It's taken, it's taken my time, my my grandfather's time. I, you know, this it, it takes a lot of time. And 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 why? What I'm really interested in now is, you know, I, I keep saying, um, I don't do anti-racism work. I'm doing black liberation work. Is this something that you can assign to? Do you want to see black communities? prosperous as well do you want to see freedom for everybody and if you want to see that we need to work out this racism thing if you want to see that you have to be pro-black you have to be rooted in black liberation you if you want the 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 end of disparity in in wealth and economic um, disparity you have to be pro-black and that's what it is and I think that um people really show what they're prepared to fight for and what they aren't when that question is posed yeah. Thank, thank you all for the, for those responses. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you to Homebake and congratulations for moving your next level. And and I, and I will say that you know when you start getting into housing and stuff, uh, you know that is a way that you start to interact with the powerful, right? You're interacting with the finances and that kind of stuff, and that is your window of an opportunity to work creatively with those people and help them. Kind of grow their sensibility in terms of how they spend their resources and 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 creativity, you know, in dealing with the issues that you're trying to deal with. But anyway, okay, uh, that's that's it for me. Though I have to run; I'm already late. But uh, anyway, I enjoyed it, and I hope everyone has a good conversation. And yeah, okay, bye, -bye. bye. Thank you, Rick. Bye. Um, yeah, we had some uh, miscommunication about the time. Rick was waiting for us an hour earlier <laughs> um, uh, already. Um, I think I think this was something uh, that Rick just said while he was going out. So, um, and I think this is something that um, I think Homebaked is also been very much aware of that uh, for a long time. Um, um, we were sometimes, I think, also very bold in speaking about, like, you know, our form of resistance and, and how we, we felt things should change. But there comes this moment where you need to start negotiating uh, with the powers to be uh, and to figure out um, in quite, quite often long processes how to then resource this radical imagination of a community to build together, how to resource them, how to cut through um, through policy, how to uh, rethink uh, ownership, how to then think about sharing wealth, uh, sharing the growth that is that is going to happen, who's part of it, uh, whose voices are maybe too loud already uh, or again, uh, and how to uh, to work with that. So I'm just also looking to my co-host uh, Sam, who has been uh, very much. Uh, uh, putting things in the chat. Thank you, Sam. Um, if you would like to say something um, uh, about how to make sure that we keep listening and keep also um, growing together and not some parts growing quicker than other parts. Oh, it's a long road to that one. Um, I think the conversations that need to happen at the, at the gr grassroots and decision 
making needs to be made at the grassroots as well. Um, Home Baked has, has had many iterations and it, it has developed into different infrastructures. That if it has three different organisations in a sense now and they've all got different modalities of how they work, of how how we how people own those businesses, own those organisations, own the development of their neighbourhood. I think putting those um, in some ways, the legal infrastructures help as well as the sorts of infrastructures that we have on the ground with the engagement it's you know and also showing people we're moving forward it's not just a conversation it's action and asking people to be involved in those conversations and those decision making um, and to see that movement and to see where it's going to know that it will achieve what they want it to and not all these conversations that have happened the consultation that's happened for decades that you know they choose what they want and it moves forward. It, it manifests in different ways, in businesses, in social and you know, engagement, in culture, um, and supporting new businesses and uh, you know, developing its, its own, its high street, its ecology, its environment around there. And ha these things are, are, in some ways they're nebulous, but you have to be on the ground all the time um and allow that space for people to to input even if it's just a comment or a conversation to capture that and make sure that's followed through and it's having people there working to do that as well um which home bait has had uh, about it's over 10 years <laughs> um a decade of of trying different things out and seeing what works what doesn't work and then trying to, you know, reshape the things that do work and move that forward, but reshaping it with the people that are coming in as well, always inviting new voices, because things can, you don't want it to be the same people, it has to move forward and, and fields is changing. You know, it had the failed housing market renewal, but there's people moved up or people are moving back in. So how do you include them into the conversation? And, you know, being on the ground and having those conversations all the time but also having the systems in place that actually uh, as I say moves things forward makes it real yeah and I think that is something that um, for instance I quite often say that if we want to move together in in any way or form then these are steep learning curves full of political uncertainties because we have to learn how to manage land, we have to learn how to set up businesses, we have to learn how to uh, create more in, in, uh, inclusive structures and more ethical structures ourselves. And these are often quite steep learning curves. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that is important, and I think Rick started with that, uh, is like that this is not uh, a closed, circle that this is a continuous struggle uh, that needs to be fought and that that struggle needs to be open enough for people to uh, leave if they need to leave and for other people to step in if they want to step in so that it is a collective continuous growth and not like uh, a closed uh, a closed group of people who who then either try to push it and make it or not but that it is something that builds towards collective wealth uh, that hopefully um, um, can continue uh, mm -hmm. through generations or as Amara said like already been working for it for generations so um, I'm looking if there are any questions from the audience or if any uh, other people want to ask some questions to uh, Amara and Fiona I think while you look can I just come in on that because I think that that the scale of all the things that we have to do feels so much more daunting if we think that we're starting from scratch like the very fact that people have been organizing communities have been organizing for centuries and it's how we're able to have like you know some of the infrastructure some of the ideas some of the plans that we have now i'd love us to go even even more intentional about that for example when my grandparents came over from the caribbean 
and they had to set up their own um, economic systems essentially because they couldn't access the mainstream banks. Like me and my peers in, in, in our generation, we came together and said, what does it look like for us to have something like what they had that was totally built on trust and collectivism? But how do we make it like more appropriate for the 21st century and for generations ahead? So we created like there's a savings scheme, but there's also like an investment strand. And we say, like, how do we collectivize and and what do we want to invest in? And I think there's acknowledging the power that we do hold collectively, like being really, really serious about the power that we can galvanize and hold collectively. And also what are the things, what are the blueprints that have already been laid so that we don't have to go and recreate the labor? What are the things that we can already um, mobilize on? Thank you so much. Um, there was a question earlier from Andrew. Um, um, they asked um, uh, for Fiona um, the following question about the work featuring the police and their reading of stories. Can you describe how the work was set up for those taking part, please? Um, I'm just uh, think that's a very important question, but I'm also very wary of the time. So uh, Fiona, could you maybe say something that maybe quite shortly in relation also to what we had just been discussing about how do we set up uh, spaces and uh, trajectories of actually, uh, um, you know, working with power, but also distributing power differently? Yeah, sure. I, I can be really brief. I mean, the, that the event there with the police is one of a number and it was quite a sustained relationship working with, you know, different levels of policing and I suppose in response to Rick's question around the overserve, when I think really one of the huge intentions at that time was, was also to affect policing. And, you know, we were working to try to develop police training and other aspects that weren't just about the benefits to young people, but really about trying to address the institution. And um, I guess maybe the key thing just to say is that there, technically there was a lot involved in the orchestrating of the performance of that moment where the police would read the stories, just I suppose on a value system one of the key things was that it wasn't a symbolic event, that actually what happened there was happening in real life for the first time with everybody present. So there was no rehearsal or it was a moment where the, you know, the, the police would read the stories back to the young people and the young people were part of how the police understood them in that moment. We were all physically present. So it was a very haptic experience. Um, obviously, the, there's a film of it and that has another value like many of these things but but maybe just that it was part of a much longer process of really trying to engage with the police and think about how more dignity and respect could be paid to working class young people in the way they were they were policed in the in an urban context and so that that was always the intention as well as you know for young people to go through a process always the intention about looking at that power structure and how it functioned in the area um, and working with uh, quite junior police officers, you know, who are early enough in their formation that maybe that type of an experience could influence them. But there's lots, there's lots written about that piece technically in terms of how it happened, if, you know, which I can refer people to if, if someone wants to know the exact detail. Thank you for that answer. Um, and I'm also looking at the time, unfortunately, because I think there's so much we could still discuss. And I hope um, Amanda, Fiona and Rick and, and a lot of other people here in the room and of course, uh, all the members of Home Baked, um, CLT and Home Baked Bakery and Home Baked Homegrown Brewery and Samantha that we can continue some of this conversation in, in maybe smaller, uh, smaller forums. Um, because I think that it is important, which um, I see uh, Catherine writing here in the chat, that this, um, uh, as Amara said, that, that we acknowledge and are being serious about power we hold collectively. And I think we heard a lot of like stories today about how uh, we can build power collectively, uh, how we are going to be serious about it, and how are we also acknowledging uh, um, this. and. Um, I feel there is much more to say and to tell uh, about that, but we sort of like wanted to um, close in good spirit um, um, of home baked is that we always end with a story, a poem, or a song um, that has been part of our journey uh, um, to do that, um, and. Um, 
I think um, we asked uh, Chris Shepard. Shepard is here. I hope he's. I'm here. here. I'm, uh, yeah, I think you should hear me now. So I'm here. <laughs> yeah, to tell a little bit about uh, a project that has been sort of from the beginning um, dear to home baked because it sort of channeled a lot uh, of uh, the spirit that uh, that that home baked holds dear. Yeah, well, uh, I'm Chris Shepherd. I'm a, a, a sort of film director, filmmaker, artist, all kinds of things, really. And I grew up in Anfield and I left home in 89 and I've done lots of things. I've been nominated for BAFTAs and BIFFAs and done lots of things all over the world. Screen my films all over the world, but with people like David Shrigley, Chris Morris, uh, you know, Arthur Matthews, Graham Linehan, all kinds of things. Anyway, I am... Um, I, and so, um, you know, Anfield's a very dear place to me because um, I grew up there. I remember Mitchell's Bakery. I mean, the way it used to be when I was a kid, I used to go in there and I used to go and get, um, uh, you know, you know, sausage rolls off the old women who used to work behind the counter. And I used to marvel at the, um, at the, uh, the, the coffee, there was like a coffee machine on the side of the, the bakery. And I was always, as a kid, fascinated by how it worked because it seemed really glamorous to have a coffee machine on the side of a bakery in Anfield in the 1970s and 80s. And um, so, I, you know, I, you know and, I, and the other thing about Liverpool is, is I always have this before and after thing about Liverpool. When I was a kid, 70s, 80s, it was on a decline. And I'd always fantasize about how it was in the 50s when Liverpool was the world power and everything was, you know, it had dominance over the world and Graf Zeppelins would come and dock <laughs> and people, there'd be amazing things would come to the city, you know? And, um, but in the eighties, it wasn't quite like that. It was always like derelict buildings, which I love. And, um, but as I moved to London and then when I um, uh, looked at, um, I went back home and I realized that the whole area of, uh, of around about Oakfield Road was getting knocked down and demolished. And I was, you know, quite upset about that because I remember that there was a big, demo there was a big uh, uh, slum clearance in the 80s, you know, 70s and 80s with a whole, a lot of Everton got demolished then. And so to see the rest of Anfield going upset me. So I thought it'd be great to shoot a pop promo, you know, um, or I'll make a document of this. And uh, I was listening to BBC Six and it was this great, um, uh, folk singer called Grace, pa Grace Petrie and I heard her and she was very political and she was singing about rising up and and uh, having a voice and, and not taking nonsense off people you know and I listened to her and I thought she was like the clash or you know political and I got in touch with her and said why don't we do a film and why don't we film it in Anfield in these streets that were all being demolished and what was great with it was being Liverpool it's not like London, where you can't get permission to film anywhere. In Liverpool, everybody's like, oh, come on, mate, you got your camera, get in with that, film that, film the house getting knocked down, do this, do that. And they let me film anything I wanted. I had no insurance or anything. It was pretty insane. And I did it. And then we got Grace, then we did this promo. And I'm very proud of it because it documents that area so well just before it was demolished. And I remember going to the, um, the Salisbury pub on Salisbury Road. Just before it was demolished, I think I must have been the last person to walk in it before it was demolished. And I had friends who lived in Astrid, so I went to school with. So, so the film means a lot to me. And I know that um, Home Base used it as part of the guided tour that they did. Um, and they picked people up from city centre and guided them around Anfield. And I was so proud of that because I'm from Anfield and my heart is always with Anfield. So, what I want to do now is I want to show you, I'm going to show you the film now. Let me, um, uh, oh, hold on. Chris, do you have one minute? Um, yeah. Um, yes, because I, I just want to say that after the, the, the showing of the, the clip, which takes a few minutes, uh, we will have a proper a wrap up and a proper closing. Um, and I think it's super nice that we are uh, looking at the film because behind me, you have seen a lot of images of people who contributed with their work uh, through Home Baked and with all their forms of creativity. So uh, Chris, give us the film. Oh yeah, here we go. Are you ready for it now? Let me just do my internet business. Here we go. Oh no, that's it. Oh, you, 
uh, I know, I figure you can all see that, yeah? Is it all looking good? Oh, yes, that's what I like to hear. Here we go. You should get sound. You should get the whole the whole thing. This is the Grace Patry, directed by me, and Rod Mayne, who's also from Liverpool. I went to Liverpool uh, Polytechnic did Foundation with him, a great, a great editor and filmmaker. Here we go. Can we meet your blood with kindness? Can we meet your hate with love? Can we keep our years of silence as you crush us from above? As the judgment day draws closer, as the reckoning draws near, there's plenty more of us than you hear. And mark my words, we will rise. Mark my words, we will Spread our wings like birds and rain down from the skies. Mark my words, we will rise. As you crush us from above, there's plenty more of us than you hear. Mark my words, we will rise. Mark my words, we will rise. Spread our wings like birds and rain down from the skies. Mark my words, we will rise. Mark my words, we will rise as Grace Petrie sings, because there's plenty much, plenty more of us out here than you. And I think uh, I always keep that sentence very close to my heart that we will rise as we are working collectively, diligently towards radical imagining our futures more equitable and just. And I want to close with thanks today because I have the honor to close today, uh, which I think is uh, something, uh, uh, a big honor to do. And as I said before, behind me are some pictures from a lot of people who contribute their creative creativity uh, to the DNA of Home Baked. Uh, and for today, also a lot of people uh, put a lot of time and effort in it. So I first want to thank uh, my guests of today, Amara, Fiona, and Rick, and Sam for being uh, um, my amazing co-host, as well as um, um, uh, Steph for showing the film. And then I want to thank the team, uh, and I want uh, you all to maybe uh, wave uh, to thank them. So thank you all very much. I thank Britt for curating this content, as always amazing. You are an amazing storyteller. And uh, that makes storytelling very much part of the DNA of, of Home Baked. Uh, our host through the day, Andrew Be Beatty, Mariana Hislips, and Samantha Jones uh, for holding the frames and facilitating the flow. Our speakers for offering so much incredible content based on the important work they continuing doing. Naomi, our amazing producer for organizing and making sure we all know what we were doing. Um, Tracy Ryan for fantastic marketing and comms, Laura Williams, Williams taking care of tech and times, very important. I try to close this at 9.30, might not sure if I, if I manage. Um, breaking Ground and Paul Kelly for hosting us and the Arts Council for funding this event. Last 
but by no ways least, a very warm and special thanks to the volunteers and the team of Homebaked CLT for all their hard work, the care, love, perseverance, and courage over the last 10 years in making Homebaked what it is today. Some people of the board and volunteers are here. Please wave and we can just give them all the Zoom appreciation we can give. Let's get the terrace done. And I hope you enjoyed the event. event. Let us know. Um, there will be a publication uh, made, uh, if I'm correct, and that uh, will be available in four weeks from now uh, from this event. And um, I just um, would like to thank you all for being here. And I agree a little bit with, um, with Rick about the fact that Zoom spaces can be quite uh, difficult to obtain, but I hope that you enjoy, enjoy today a little bit uh, the different presentations and at least felt the energy and the love and the, and the perseverance of all the people uh, speaking uh, and the projects they are uh, working on and the communities uh, they are involved with. And with that, I just can only say, uh, please, let's rise together. <laughs>